This is lecture 11 in the Western intellectual tradition. We're going to call this Hermann Hess, The Politics of Servant Leadership. Hermann Hess was a very popular writer in the West, particularly in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, within the counterculture. Uh, he was sort of a rite of passage person you read to get a sense of what were the big issues that had to be looked at in terms of education, world religions, spirituality, politics, nationalism, many other issues, but he was one of the standard people that was read, and but he was misread in many ways. And so as the counterculture in North America and Europe phased out like a cloud passing in the sky by the early 1970s, because Hess was so identified with it, he seemed to pass away into oblivion, and he was not studied much in literature anymore, in German uh, courses in literature. And so he, it seemed he, he was a, a, a period thinker, a period of writer. But as I mentioned, he was misread in the 19, late 1950s, 60s, and 70s as a significant writer. And so there's been a renaissance, a revival of Hermann Hesse's writings and life the last 15, 20 years. And I want to look at the significance of Hess from a couple of his books, which are companion books, which were written when he was increasingly in mid-life, later life stride, entering his autumn years. Hesse won the Nobel Prize for Literature, not only for his great work, uh, the glass bead game or magister ludi but for a lifetime not only of literature but also of commitment to the larger political issues of his time um, but i want to look at his notion particularly in the liberal tradition of the significance of the individual and choice and agency and what taylor is doing in malaise and modernity between authentic individualism and narcissistic or egoistic individualism, and what's the difference between them? What might be Hess's understanding of the individual and the role of the individual within the public domain or public responsibility? Uh, and what's the difference between individualism and personhood and community and collectivity? Uh, Hess very much lived in the tension. He was very good friends with Martin Buber. Uh, they wrote respectfully of one another and they were very concerned with, on the one hand, a form of runaway liberalism that became, at a certain point, narcissistic. Uh, and what is the relationship between personhood, a healthy person, a mature person, and the relationship to community? And on the other hand, a very leftist notion of the collective, which in that sense submerged, subordinated, and denied healthy personhood, but which individualism was reacting to as an unhealthy collectivism. And so this tension between personhood and community was certainly something that was very important to Hess, as it was other significant thinkers as they entered the 20th century. Hess wrote a variety of books, but I want to focus just on two, as I mentioned, which bring out the notion of servant leadership. One is Journey to the East, which is a smaller book, and then the larger one, The Glass Bead Game, which is in significant way his great summa, brings together much of his thinking on the substantive issues of the time. Important thing to note in terms of Hesse's life, he was German. He, as a young man, encountered rising German nationalism, initially under Bismarck. He, and in World War I, he increasingly so critiqued German aggressiveness he was seen as a traitor to the German people. He was not patriotic. He, before World War I, seemed to be uh, emerging as one of the preem preeminent creative German writers. Some of his early works were on the cutting edge of the new literary tradition in Germany. But by World War I, most Germans were committed to the fact that uh, Germany was to move forward. It had to assume center stage in Europe. And the Bismarckian tradition was a part of that. And Hess dared to question and critique that. So he was seen uh, as a coward. He was anti-patriotic, anti-nationalist. Of course, he wasn't. He always claimed to be a good German, but not a German nationalist. 
and when Germanness and nationalism or any ethnic culture becomes equated with nationalism, the whole notion of what it means to have conscience and live with integrity um, becomes dim somewhat and um, tested very much by the notion of conscience and servanthood in his life. But to the two books, Journey to the East and The Glass Bead Game. Journey to the East, most people think to the East he must be going to Oriental religions and in comparison in contrast to Western culture or Western religions. And that is not, Hess was much too bright to idealize Oriental religions and demonize or denigrate Western traditions. He was certainly critical of a certain type of secularism, the ideology of secularism, which idealized the secular and uh, demeaned, um, dismissed the sacred or religions. His interest was in the deeper sources of spirituality that were important to many religions. But his journey to the East was not a journey to the literal East. As I said, he was a literary person. He understood the role of metaphor. The East, of course, in a metaphorical sense, is where the sun rises. So what are some of the principles that are the foundation in, in which you begin to get the, the emergence of light into the new day? Well, in the book Journey to the East, what you have is, in many ways, it anticipates much that is going on today in which a person says, I'm spiritual but not religious, as if saying like that is not just another form of religion somewhat a distorted and caricatured understanding, a thinned out, but nonetheless it's its own form of religion. But that notion of I'm spiritual but not religious was very much in vogue at the early years of the 20th century, and Hesse understood it very well. So on Journey to the East, what you have is these, these men and women on a journey to what they see as enlightenment, insight, wisdom, versus knowledge and information. So you already can see in Hess is interested in wisdom. And so you have these, these various men and women on this journey to what they see as, and they're consciously aware that the secular culture does not meet their deeper longings for purpose. Nationalism does not work either. Uh, and, and what are religions most meaningfully about at the core? Well, there is a spiritual depth to them. So there is in this journey to the East, these people are on this journey. Uh, on the journey with them is Leo. Leo is the person essentially who carries the bags, who prepares the food. He's the servant. He does what he's told, but the more intense questers, they leave all that practical details, the laboring, the work, the preparing people for the next day of the journey from shrine to shrine and from Eastern and Western sacred sites and icons to the other. They just, the day is done. Leo takes over. Um, and they're the ones who uh, have sort of indulged their spiritual journey. But when it comes to the practical elements, we leave that to someone else. And so Leo does that for him. He has a certain affinity with, with animals. Um, but he's just seen by most of the conscious spiritual ser uh, searchers as one who does the brute labor and organizes the trips. Um, and in that sense, he plays his role, but he doesn't seem to have the intense commitment to the spiritual journey. In time, as the novel unfolds, Leo disappears. And in time, um, the company, as it were, or the league begins to dissipate. And the narrator of Journey to the East this was a very intense and significant period of his life of questing for meaning, of purpose, and what is worth living for versus what are all the distractions in life. And so he goes on a quest to discover why did the League fall apart and what happens. And over a period of time, he discovers uh, Leo and... Uh, Leo encounters him and they have this ongoing discussion of why the League fell apart, who is responsible for it falling apart, this golden era of the narrator's life. And bit by bit, as the narrator moves along, Leo increasingly invites him to this gathering. Um, he had suggests to the narrative, was it the League that fell apart or was it you who fell apart? and you as a people who fell apart when the bigger struggles came on um, to truly be spiritual and serve one another. And so it wasn't the League that disappeared, it's that you who disappeared from the League because it didn't meet your expectations 
of a certain understanding of spirituality and the enlightened quest of those who saw themselves as spiritual pioneers. In time, what the narrator discovers as he goes from place to place with Leo, and eventually he's invited to a gathering of the League that Leo invites him to, that as he meets with the League itself, he discovers that as his, he raises the questions about what seems to be the disappearance of the League, is that the person who steps forward, who's the head of the League, is Leo itself. And what you have is what, of course, Hess is arguing, is often the great spiritual leaders are cloaked. Uh, one does not see them who they really are. It's like Odysseus when he returns to Ithaca. He's cloaked as a beggar, an old man. Jesus is often cloaked. They're both servants. Transfiguration reveals who he is. And often the most deeply spiritual persons in Hesse's argument, are the ones who serve. They don't seem to be spiritually intense, but they understand the deeper meaning of spirituality as the servant who is there for others, often not revealing who they really are. Now, the journey to the East anticipates the much greater work, the glass bead game. But we can see journey to the East. What Hesse is proposing is the mark of a truly mature individual, is the one who often is cloaked. People don't often know who they are substantively, um, but at the end of the day, they are revealed, in fact, as the leaders, uh, in this case, of the League. And so the East is really, for Hesse, in Journey to the East, the beginning of wisdom is the ability to have humility and to serve others and not necessarily to play the game, I'm on the spiritual quest, the contemplative quest, the meditative, but the real mark of that is how one loves, loves well, and serves insightfully. The glass bead game is a much more sophisticated work, and yet the introduction mentions it's dedicated to the journeyers to the East. So we already have hints in what Hess is doing that the um, glass bead game it's very, very much about, about servanthood. And the Glassby game is set in a context in which there has been wars, in which culture itself has become to mean pop journalism, shallow intellectual life, um, thin reads of culture and history uh, dominate, substantive thinking has disappeared. So it becomes essentially a culture of dilettantes and voyeurs, who, people who play at intellectual thought like to think they're in the know, but they are as deep as a piece of paper in that sense. They're, they're clear, but they're thin. And so it's with this denigration of culture and civilization that there emerges a class of people, the Castalians, which in that sense are, are the intellectual elite, which are trying to bring back together and synthesize the best that has been thought in world cultures and civilizations from East and West in theology and philosophy and the notion of music becomes a key analogy of the harmony or like an orchestra of many instruments played together. This harmony of bringing the very best, best together and it is the Castalians as they're trained and tested to various levels of education. Some move forward uh, and take significant leadership roles in the Castalian uh, community. But the person which emerges eventually to head the Castalian community of elite thinkers, whether it's music or the arts or culture or philosophy or theology or um, political thought, is Magister Ludi, whose name is Joseph Knecht. Uh, two things to note here. Knecht, again, in German is the word for servant. And Joseph, certainly within the biblical tradition, for those who know it well, uh, Joseph was the one who was initially marginalized by his own family uh, because of a dream that he would be a ruler. Joseph then goes on to be the key figure, particularly in domestic and elements of foreign policy in Egyptian leadership under Pharaoh himself, but which he serves not only the family which rejected him, so he knows how to forgive those who have rejected him, but he also serves the Egyptian people in times of immense famine. He had um, amazing abilities, acute abilities of servanthood. So when Hesse brings together Joseph Connect as the leader of the Castilians, he's merging both a German word of servanthood, but also um, Joseph 
as a metaphor himself and how he was a servant within the biblical context, both of his own Jewish family, but also within the Egyptian civilization itself. So when we think of Hermann Hess and the notion of the individual, which we'll be looking at in Charles Taylor's Malaise and Modernity, Hesse proposes through uh, Journey to the East and the Glass Bead Game, which each of you and all of you should certainly read before you finish your BA, one of the most important works, alongside Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. These are the two great literary works of um, German literature of the 20th century, and I'll get to um, The Magic Mountain later in the course and its significance, along with uh, Hermann Hesse, so Thomas Mann, and Hermann Hesse, key German thinkers. Um, but the key point to note here, two of, and I could mention other of Hess's works, but Journey to the East and the Glass Bee Game propose an idea that the authentic individual is not the one who is the power-hungry person, not the one who needs to dominate, but often is concealed who he or she actually is. Their deeper reality is concealed, but their actual life is one of quiet service, uh, to the community in the glass bead game. Um, it's, it's to the Castalians and Journey to the East, it's to the League. So a, a certain understanding, which certainly in the West uh, tends to, to be marginalized as the authentic life, the authentic person is the one who knows how to discerningly serve and love uh, community, others on both their spiritual and political search.